Hey, what is going on? This is Mark J. Spieler, MD, uh, aka RX Felon MD, uh, coming to you big as life, twice as ugly, and still kind of chilly this morning. It's a beautiful morning in uh, late January 2023. Um, it's getting some sunshine in the background, as you can see. And I'm going to continue on with my little, it was basically a Kratom series. Um, I've done two videos so far on, on Kratom. And uh, I think I, I mentioned in the last one that I encountered an article earlier this week about, um, it was actually about Kratom and Tianeptine. Tianeptine is something else. Um, but the reason, uh, and, and I'll just kind of introduce the article. It's, it's called um, State Representative Working to Get Kratom Off Shelves in Mississippi. So this is, this is a drugs issue that's going on in Mississippi. Um, and this is covered by local news down there. I don't, I don't really know how it ended up on my news feed, but um, I saw it and I clicked on it and it, it, it was interesting to me. So uh, apparently it's interesting to other people because it's like a, a little bit of a debate down there, I guess. Um, and it, it, it has some of the classic classic overtones of the war on drugs, I guess. And, you know, it brings, brings to light a lot of issues that, um, you know, that are inherent in, in deciding how as a society that we, you know, regulate, um, the use and consumption and sale of drugs, you know, psychoactive substances, what have you. So this is out of Pine Belt, Mississippi. Um, and I thought this article was particularly important because, um, at least the way it's written, it kind of, it almost lumps Kratom and Tianeptine as, it, it almost talks about them as if they're the same thing, um, but they're not. And I'll get into the differences here in a minute. Let me just review this article. Um, it says Kratom and Tianeptine, Kratom and Tianeptine could find themselves off the shelves in Mississippi. State Representative Donnie Scogin, or Scoggin, I'm not sure, uh, how to say it, but uh, he is working to pass House Bill 364, making both Schedule 1, making both Schedule 1, meaning making Kratom and Tianeptine Schedule 1, making it illegal to sell them. So he's that state representative is working to pass that um, House Bill in Mississippi on the state level. Like I was talking about before, um, at least as far as kratom goes, and there's there's almost a, there's so many other chemicals that that fall into this type of thing, um, that end up being regulated or outlawed or whatever. Um, this one talks about kratom and tianeptine. Um, he this representative says once it's illegal to sell, then hopefully we can get it off the gas store shelves and make it a whole lot harder to get. Um, so there's uh, the the news uh, you know they they always tend to cover the the more dramatic horror story type things so <clears throat> I talk about this lady named Anne Marie Brom uh it says she has strong feelings against kratom due to personal experiences she was quoted as saying the effects of kratom will forever affect me and I didn't even take it uh, she said that her husband killed himself after taking a significant amount of kratom I I listened to the video that's like embedded in this article and it sounded like her husband pretty much, um, that he had had a Kratom addiction. And it sounded like he had some mental health problems too. I, I, I don't know if, how much or, or to what extent it was precipitated by Kratom, but she, she seems to think it was. And I mean, you know, it could very well be. Um, she said that he turned violent and killed himself, um, it, you know, obviously it's just a little, it was like a little 15 second snippet. So you really don't get a lot of the background information, but you know, the news put that, put that out there in this article. So she's quoted as saying, quote, anytime I go into a store and see a big glass case of Kratom, I just want to smash the glass. Um, an article goes on to say that local officials said that the negative side effects have no bounds. Some say the worst part is the addictiveness. This uh, representative says it's extremely addictive. It's got the same qualities as an opioid does. And this other guy, um, 
Jatuan Stevens, uh, director of Dying to Live. I, I looked up Dying to Live, and it's it's some sort of like faith based organization. Um, I'm not sure if it's a church or like some sort of a recovery program. I, I don't know. Um, but it's uh, apparently that it's a it's a religious organization that works with people suffering from addiction and homelessness and stuff. So this that guy's quoted as saying, it's a sleeping terror in our community that is readily accessible. Um, but then in fairness, the article also talks about the other side of the argument too. Um, some people claim to experience positive side effects from Kratom. This representative is quoted as saying, quote, a lot of patients say it helps. It helps with pain. It helps with the myalgia and arthritis, things like that. Yet, well, that's the end of the quote. Then he says, yet, um, he hopes to see House Bill 364 passed into law and see what's referred to as, quote, gas station heroin, end quote, off the shelves. Um, now, gas station heroin is not Kratom. Just just being clear, like, I've never heard of Kratom called ga gas station heroin. I, the thing that's known as gas station heroin is TNeptine. That's a totally different thing. And the, one of the problems I have with this article is, the main problem, I guess, is that um, they're pretty much categorizing Kratom and TNeptine. They're almost making them sound like the same thing, and they're not the same thing. And you know, just just for reasons of uh, in, putting accurate information out there, I'm going to explain what, what the differences are. I've already talked about Kratom a bunch. Um, Kratom's a plant that comes out of the ground that's, uh, you know, the leaves and sometimes other plant parts are basically chopped up and packaged for sale. And um, if it's done correctly, they're standardized. Um, it's it's listed on the, on the package, like the at least the kratom I have is has metragenine and uh, seven hydroxy metragenine maximum amounts. You know, I think per weight maybe, or percentage amounts, um, and it's consistent. You know, I've I've bought that stuff many times. I think it's a reputable provider of kratom, and uh, it's listed on the it's listed on the bottle. What's in it? You know, in terms of the psychoactive. So. Um, Tianeptine, which I'll talk about more in, in a minute, is actually a pharmaceutical product. It's not a plant. It's not, um, it's a pill or a powder, you know, it's, it's made in a lab. It's actually a prescription drug in other, um, some other countries, just not in, in the United States. Um, so they're, I mean, really the only thing they have in common is that they're sold over the counter currently and they have opioid effects. Tianeptine has pretty strong opioid effects, it seems like. Um, and I'll get into that in a minute, but yeah, that's the main issue I have with this article. It's just that they're, they're not drawing a correct distinction between the two. Um, and my personal opinion is that being that they're different, like Kratom's like basically a plant product and TNeptine is a, is a pharmaceutical. They need to be regulated in, in a different way, but they're, you know, they're lumped into this house bill and if you, if you don't, if you don't know the difference, like you would think they're saying Kratom is gas station heroin and that TNeptine and hair or, um, Kratom are, are the same thing. They're just lumping them together. And I, I don't think that's the correct way to go about it. And unfortunately people who don't know which uh, much about this stuff, which is probably the majority of the population, um, you know, unless you, unless you had experience or, or you were interested, I mean, I'm, I'm both, but, um, most people, they'd read this and just, you know, go on and uh, not really consider the differences. So um, it's another way that drugs become scheduled and, and outlawed and they, they just, they get lumped in together sometimes. And this is just one of the ways it happens. And this, this being on the state level. So, um, but of course, this, this Scoggin guy or Scogin is a, he's a politician and he's quoted as saying, we as Mississippians can bring this to a new light, make it illegal to see or make it illegal to buy. You got to love journalism sometimes the way they put there's typos in there. It must must mean illegal to sell. 
but it says illegal to see. So take that for what it is. Um, let me start over with that. We as Mississippians can bring this to a new light, make it illegal to sell or make it illegal to buy and then get it off the shelves and hopefully protect our people. So this is always done in the name of protecting the public. And, um, you know, it usually just leads to different compounds popping up in its place. And if these become illegal, then something else will take its place. So I don't know. I think it'd be better to regulate these things rather than just outlaw them and, and evaluate them separately and from a public health, like with the input of public health experts, not just politicians and cops, but I don't know. I, maybe I'm inferring some of the things that are going on with this, um, based on this article, but that's pretty much all it says. And, um, so let me, I mean, some people may already know, but, um, I'm going to talk about T and Eptine now. T and Eptine, I'll just tell you, I mean, I have experience with Kratom, like I've said, and, you know, many other drugs. Um, T and Eptine is not one of them. Um, I first read about it maybe a year or two ago. Um, I suppose I could buy it. You know, it, it's, it's still, it's still legal to buy and possess in most places, but I don't know. I don't, I don't really, I don't really want to do that, but Anyway, uh, so this is from Wikipedia. Um, T and Eptine is a pharmaceutical drug sold under the names Stablon and Coaxal. It's actually an atypical tricyclic antidepressant used mainly in the treatment of major depressive disorder and also used to treat other conditions like anxiety, asthma, and irritable bowel syndrome. That, that's Wikipedia saying that. I don't know. Um, like I said, it's not, it's not approved for, for use uh, in, in the United States, like as a pharmaceutical, um, they're actually selling it, you know, whoever's selling it, selling it as, as a dietary supplement. So that kind of gets around like the FDA regulations on drugs and stuff. So that's, I don't think the best way to go about things either. Um, but a lot of times drugs start out like that and then they get scheduled you know, they get outlawed kind of like the House Bill 364 is, is aiming to do with uh, T and Eptine in Mississippi. Um, it has antidepressant and anxiolytic effects with relative lack of sedative, anticholinergic, and car uh, cardiovascular side effects. It has been found to act, this is important, it has been found to act as an atypical agonist of the mu opioid receptor with clinically negligible effects on the Delta and Kappa opioid receptors. Uh, what that means is that it works on the same receptors as any other, you know, opioid that, addictive opioid, you know, like heroin, pain pills, like all that stuff, they all act on the mu opioid receptor. And that's, that's how you get the opioid effects. So, yeah, so it's, it's a different thing than Kratom. They both have opioid effects. To me, T and Eptine, generally speaking, seems, um, it's not, like, having never done it, um, it, it sounds a lot to me like Tramadol. Tramadol also has, um, you know, antidepressant mechanism, mechanism of action. Tramadol is, a, I, um, I'm pretty sure it's a Schedule Four um, controlled substance in the United States. It's, it's a painkiller, um, I don't know how it compares to T and Eptine. I, I have taken Tramadol before. It definitely has opioid effects. Um, and it also has, a, I think I'm almost a mild stimulant effect. I think that's because it's a, it's basically, I think an SSRI or an S, SNRI. Um, but yeah, it, it has its own special feeling. And I imagine T and Eptine is similar, but I'm just speculating because I've never taken it. I, I can't say for sure. Um, but, uh, there is a, there is a vice article about TNFT and this is from about, um, six weeks ago. It's called quote, <sighs> come on. There we go. Okay. It's from vice news from December 12th, 2022 by Manisha Krishnan. Um, called gas station heroin is causing intense withdrawals. It's legal in most states. 
Tien, and, and then the article goes on to say, Tianeptine is an antidepressant, but it's being sold in the U.S., especially at gas stations, as a dietary supplement and functions like an opioid. That's what I was saying before. Um, it's known as gas station heroin. Uh, it has been banned by several states. I mean, I was just talking about how that's looking like it may happen in Mississippi. It's happened in a bunch of other states, too. But um, as far as I know, on the federal level, it's still unscheduled. Um, so uh, the article talks about a lot of the stuff that I have already got into. Um, there's a Dr. Patrick Marsh Marshalik, I think that's how you say it, Marshalik, associate professor at West Virginia University School of Medicine. I presume that's in Morgantown. Um, he's quoted as saying, people are, he's talking about TNEPTINE, quote, people are using it either to manage uh, withdrawal from harder, harsher stuff, or they're kind of starting their journey and developing an unhealthy relationship with it based on its effects. And its effects are opioid-like effects. Um, he, I'm just going to go through his quotes again. He's quoted later in the article. Um, uh, let's see. Says that although he hasn't heard of widespread TNEPTINE use, he says that he sees the drug falling into a similar landscape as synthetic cannabinoids and bath salts, both of which have a history of being sold um, over the counter in gas stations, smoke shops, stuff like that. Um, as basically, um, they're basically legal until they get scheduled, you know, and and they're just just being kind of a free for all sold. Like not re like their manufacturer and distribution aren't um, really regulated at all. So, um, and like those substances, he sees the target users as being people who can't access more traditional drugs or people who regularly get drug tested. "Quote: You think you're doing safe stuff because it's not street drugs, but it's kind of maybe a little bit closer to it than you would think," he said. "It's a scenario that plays out time and time again with prohibition," he added where people turn to legal highs or more potent drugs when something becomes illegal. Exactly. And that's kind of what I've been getting at. He said the companies can take advantage of the fact that there's very little oversight of these substances. Quote, can you trust these folks that are really looking to make money and only do that? Do they have the same safety practices that pharmaceutical companies would or the same degree of oversight from the FDA? Um, end quote. So uh, great question, you know, I mean, and that's the thing, like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm all for freedom and people being able to do what they want with their bodies and take the drugs that they want. But, um, I mean, I, I don't know, like, I, I, like you really, I don't know how much assurance you have, like about a lot of these drugs that aren't really, that aren't properly regulated. I mean, for the most part, they may be fine, but I mean, there's, it's really, I mean, there's a lot, there's not very much oversight of dietary supplements and stuff like that. And when you make psychoactive pharmaceuticals and sell them as dietary supplements, you know, unless you're, unless you got some good chemists and good production and stuff like that, I mean, then, then the company would be responsible for it and, and they don't really have oversight. So I think you could run into problems there. Um, I don't know exactly, but um, that, those are just my thoughts on it. Um, so yeah, uh, I think I'm going to tell the story of this guy, uh, that the article talks about, um, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> This is, it's not really funny, it's kind of sad, but, I mean, this is, this is a, an example of addictive behavior with TNEPTINE. Hunter Barnett, age 26, who has a painful esoph esophagus condition and has been addicted to opioids in the past. That's important to know, he has a previous opioid addiction. He was skeptical that TNEPTINE could be effective, but when he moved to Pensacola, Florida from Alabama, he noticed that every time he went to the gas station, people were buying Zaza Reds. Apparently, Zaza Reds is a over-the-counter TNEPTINE containing preparation, we'll say. Uh, Ms. Barnett is quoted as saying, 
I'm sitting here thinking it's a gas station. This shit ain't going to be any good, end quote. Still, he bought some and eventually switched over to, brand, to a brand called TD Red, which he described as feeling like a mix of Percocets and cocaine. And that's why I said it's probably a little bit like Tramadol. Tramadol is like a, has a, like a sort of a stimulant, like a mild stimulant effect too. Percocets and cocaine is kind of, I, I doubt it really feels just like that, but I mean, I get, I suppose I get what they're talking about. Barnett is quoted as saying, they were amazing. Like, wow, it took away all the pain. But within five days, he said, he began upping his dose. While he started taking three at a time every few hours, he can now take an entire bottle of 15 pills in one go. So now, now he's taking handfuls of tea and eptine. So obviously, I mean, you can see like, I think, I think it has a significant addiction potential, you know? I mean, this is just one guy's story, but um, I could definitely see this. If it has a strong enough opioid effect, he's been addicted before. His body gets used to opioids really quickly. And, and before he knows it, he's just, he's just taken more and more. So, um, I suppose that could happen with Kratom too. Um, but my guess is that TNFT is a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit stronger of an opioid. I don't, I don't know exactly how, how else to say it, but, um, that's my guess. Uh, but you, you do hear, you do hear of people taking massive amounts of Kratom too. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's not, it's not without its risks. And personally, that's why that's, I mean, be honest, like I wouldn't mind trying TNEPTINE. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really looking to start a new habit and I don't really feel like going to look for it. But if it were there and it's legal, I mean, i I may try it just to, just to try it, but I definitely don't want to end up like that guy. And I've, I've been a little bit like that before, you know, not being able to stop using opioids and just, if I did, I'd get really sick. And so that's why if, if I take Kratom, it's pretty infrequently. So, um, you can, you can say what you want about that. I'm just being honest about it. Um, I don't feel like I have anything to hide with that. I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, for one, whatever reason, circumstances and, and, and choice, I guess I, I never took the pledge, you know, I never joined AA or NA or promised anyone that I'd never, never take a drug. I, I just, you know, having been on probation for so long, like I, I don't take the illegal ones. I don't take ones that are going to come up positive on a, on a drug test, you know, that I'm prohibited from taking. But, you know, I, I do what I do. And like, I, I try to find what works for me. And, and like, that's, that's it, you know? And so anyway, I, so I, I kind of feel for this Barnett guy, you know, he, I've known a lot of people like this and this, this happens. Um, he said that the effects wear off quickly. He would sometimes take them before bed and have to wake up in the middle of the night to take more to avoid going into withdrawal. The same thing used to happen with me when I was doing heroin. Like I would, I would do a line before I went to bed. And then like five or six hours later, I'd wake up and start being sick already. And, and I'd have to do another little, little line if I wanted to go back to sleep. Um, so it, it's horrible, you know? And I mean, I, it, that can happen with anything from fentanyl, heroin to Kratom and Tianeptine. So it's, um, but I don't think banning them is the answer. Um, uh, yeah, at the very least they need quality control and regulation. And I, I don't think that you can reliably satisfy that need with, a, with like a, basically a complete lack of regulation. So, um, anyway, this Barnett guy said he, you get the picture, but he said that he began going through three to six bottles a day, um, each costing $30. So he's spending quite a bit on his, on his, on his habit. He said he started working his job, delivering groceries via Instacart every day, but was still broke doing or due to how much he was spending on the pills. I, I bet. He said he spent about $50,000 since January. I guess that's over the past year. Um, cause this article was written in December. So 
Um, when Barnett spoke to Vice News, he said he had just come off a 10-day detox that he said was more difficult than when he came off of opioids like oxycodone, fentanyl, and buprenorphine. He said he experienced nausea, sweats, vomiting, fever, body pain, and relentless chills. So all the classic opioid withdrawal symptoms. Signs and symptoms, I guess. Um, quote, the withdrawal, I can honestly say, is the absolute, absolute worst experience of my life. Period, end quote. So I, this, you know, this is just one guy's story again, but he... Um, I mean, if, if this is at all true, uh, tianeptine is, you know, ha can be very addictive and very strong. It sounds like it's quite a strong drug, especially when taken to extreme excess like this guy did. Um, uh, article goes on to say, I'm going to wrap this up here in a couple minutes, uh, but Kirsten Smith, a researcher with the National Institute on Drug Abuse, said a couple of factors impact the severe withdrawal. The incredibly high doses that some people are taking and the fact that many of these products include proprietary blends, so nobody really knows what's inside them. Quote, Tianeptine is part of a broader story of people taking a bunch of crap and not knowing what they're taking, Smith said, adding that she hasn't heard of any researchers buying Tianeptine products and testing what's in them, only because it's uh, likely because it's not on anyone's radar. She was the lead author of a paper on Reddit posts about Tianeptine from 2012 to 2020 that was published in the American Journal of Drug and Alcohol Abuse last year. She said 81% of posts liken Tianeptine to an opioid, 83% mentioned addiction, and over 70% mentioned withdrawal. So a high number of these Reddit um, you know, comments or conversations or whatever talk about uh, opioid effects, addiction, and withdrawal. So, I, I mean, to me, it's pretty obvious. Like, like I, I think it's probably about on par with tramadol, um, which is a significant opioid. So, and it's completely unregulated at this time. And, and I don't think that's a good thing. Like, I don't know. I'm probably sounding like a broken record, but that's, you know, it's what it is. Um, it's, uh, article says a subreddit called, uh, r forward slash quitting tianeptine so the quitting tianeptine subreddit has more than 3800 members with people sharing horror stories of their withdrawal and giving each other advice on how to get off the drug um vice news reached out to several manufacturers and reach and retailers that sell tianeptine to ask for comment on the health concerns surrounding the drug but did not receive a response um in February, the FDA issued a warning stating that tianeptine has been associated with serious harm, overdoses, and death. The warning said tianeptine retailers are, quote, making dangerous and unproven claims that tianeptine can improve brain function and treat anxiety, depression, pain, opioid use disorder, and other conditions. Period, end quote. That's just basically the, like, they're getting around the FDA's regulations with that, but probably committing violations because they're, stating that all these health benefits can happen. I don't, I don't know. I'm just going by what the article said. I haven't seen any TNEPTEEN manufacturers and what they've said, but I'm just basically reporting what this article says. Um, it said people with opioid addictions are particularly at risk when using TNEPTEEN. And it talks about some of the many adverse effects, such as agitation, drowsiness, confusion, sweating, rapid heartbeat, high blood pressure, nausea, vomiting, slowed or stopped breathing, that's an important one, slowed or stopped breathing. I suppose if you take enough tianeptine, you'll get an opioid overdose and you can die. Um, surprise it doesn't mention seizures. I, I would think that with its mechanism of action, if you took way too much of it, you, you'd be have the possibility of getting a seizure. I know that happens with tramadol, but it doesn't say that, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, yeah, okay, well... Yeah, that's basically it. I, I just wanted to, I wanted to talk about TNEPTEEN um, and differentiate it from Kratom. Uh, I've, if you want to, uh, if you haven't seen the previous videos about uh, Kratom, I talked pretty extensively about what that is. TNEPTEEN, I've talked, for, you know, decently well about what it is here. And just remember in that house bill, they're lumping those two together. And I don't think it's necessarily the right way to go about uh, regulating that, like I've said. So, Anyway, we're coming up on 30 minutes. 
on this video. Uh, if you've gotten this far, I really appreciate you listening. Um, thank you. And uh, please hit the like button if you like this video and um, subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you would, that would be doing me a solid. Um, and I'm going to continue to just keep putting out content and uh, hopefully some of it will stick. So uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Take care. RX Felon MD out for now. Peace.